Imagine with me for a moment that you're a 16-year-old girl in Virginia in the 1950s. You're an African-American girl, and your best friend had just died in a tragic bus accident. This is the exact situation in which Barbara Johns found herself in 1951. And what she did next is a true story of perseverance and victory. Thank you for joining me for this special edition of the Virginia History Podcast in conjunction with American Evolution, Virginia to America, 1619 to 2019. You can visit their website at AmericanEvolution2019.com. American Evolution seeks to highlight events from Virginia's history beginning in 1619 that have influenced and affected America as we know it today. For this episode, I had the distinct privilege of interviewing Kanan Townsend, who is the great-grandson of one of Barbara John's classmates, and was involved in the Brown vs. Board of Education of 1954. Canaan, again, thank you for meeting with me. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Appreciate the tour and getting around, uh, looking looking through the Milton Museum. Definitely give me a lot of insight, a lot of, a lot of things to learn about. Did have a couple of questions. Can you go ahead and uh, explain the background and significance of the Milton Museum and, and why not only Virginians but also Americans should know about this place and the events that took place here in the, in the 1950s? Sure, absolutely. Um, so the Milton Museum today, formerly known as Robert Russo Milton High School, which was a segregated high school for African Americans, during the segregation era. April 23rd, 1951, led by a 16-year-old junior, Barbara Rose Johns, led 490 almost students out on on protest um, to protest their unequal facilities, their unequal facilities. 500 kids uh, walked out of this building and eventually started a lawsuit that would join Brown versus Board of Education. Um, But it took took a lot to kind of get to that point. I mean, their parents had been fighting for years, the administrators, the teachers, um, and it took a lot to kind of get them to that point. Um, so this building was actually built in 1939 for about 180 students. And by 1951, there were close to 500. So it meant they had classes outside, classes in their buses, two or three classes going on in their auditorium space, wherever they could, could really find the room. So uh, eventually en- enough was enough. You know, many of these students had to pass by the segregated white high school on their way to school, uh, Farmville High School. So they're constantly being reminded of these inequalities. And eventually, you know, it got to Barbara, it got to her classmates, and they decided it couldn't be their teachers, couldn't be their parents. They all had much more to lose in their opinion, but you can't really punish the students. You know, what? how could the situation be worse than what it already was? And it was unfortunately a bus accident that uh, five students were killed in the accident, and that really kind of sparked the rest of the way um, for April 23rd, 1951. Barbara stood on the stage um, and she took her heel and she wrapped it like a gavel and she said, let's walk out of here. You know, let's do something about this. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they they did. They went on strike. 1951, you know, why people need to know about this. I mean, that's four years before Rosa Parks is down on the bus. At this point in time, Martin Luther King Jr. is still in college. Mm-hmm. And these students are here, you know, before Selma, before Montgomery peacefully protesting for an equal education. What I like to say is that people know, of course, Rosa Parks, right? She sat down on the bus, but before every Rosa Parks, there's a Claudette Colvin, right? Before every Martin Luther King Jr., there's a Reverend Vernon Johns, right? Before every Little Rock, there's a a Farm Bill, there's a a Moton. And these students really, we call it the student birthplace of the Civil Rights Movement, and very much so for, for a reason. And they helped to sparked the rest of the movement throughout the country. When you were showing me through the building, you mentioned that, that bus crash. So my listeners understand, how old were the uh, bus drivers? Yeah. Who was driving the bus? Yeah, yeah. So everything at the school was handed down, and that mm-hmm. included the buses, many of which were not really fit to still be used. And then they couldn't afford to hire full-time bus drivers, um, so they had students, students driving the buses, which was a fairly common practice, but still not 
the greatest of practices, but 16, 17, 18 year old students driving these buses to school. Um, and so, yeah, the bus, which should have been retired a long, long time ago, proceeded to cross these train tracks. The bus stalls, they can't get it back started. And unfortunately, it gets hit by the train. And five students pass in the accident, and one of which was Barbara John's best, best friend. So she decided not only is this a threat to our education, but this is a threat to our lives. We can't make it to school safely, let alone have a quality education once we get there. Why do these events matter? Even more specifically, I mean, they, they happen, but certainly why do they matter for us today in 2018? Absolutely. In 2018, I mean, I like to think that history is cyclical, right? Mm -hmm. We learn about history to not let the bad things happen again, but also to explain the things that are going on today. So there really aren't too many original problems, right? right. Problems are, right. you know, very repetitive. And these students here understood that even though they were the base of that pyramid, right? So the superintendent and school board are at the top and they're at the bottom. They understood that the bottom's the biggest piece of the pyramid. They understood that combined, you know, they were bigger than all the other pieces of the pyramid combined. You know, sure. they represent the biggest and most important piece of that pyramid. So if they stuck together mm. for one unified cause, they could make difference. You know, they could be involved in their process and make significant change what they did do. And I think today, you know, we can draw much inspiration from from these students Certainly. and from their drive and from their unwillingness to settle for less. They started off only wanting what was entitled by the law. Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896, separate but equal. Mm -hmm. Schools were very separate and very unequal. But eventually what they got was integrated schools throughout the country in the form of Brown versus Board of Education. Very important to know about it. And I think, like I said, these students are an inspiration. They're much greater sacrifice to Barbara Johns, um, having to move away after the strike, mm -hmm. to her family. I didn't mention this before, but their house was burned down after mm -hmm. the Brown decision. Um, and they wanted to come back to the county and live, but no bank in town would give them credit to buy a new mm -hmm. house, so they had to leave. So through great much personal turmoil for these students and sacrifice, you know, they were able to get something accomplished that helped a whole lot more people than they were truly expecting. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a great example for us to look to today. Were there other similar historic events like what was taking place here in Farmville at that period in time? Not really. Mm -hmm. uh, so the Brown original Brown decision with Linda Brown, Topeka, Kansas, so they had already, if I'm remembering correctly, had lost their court case at their state level. Mm -hmm. um, and they were going through appeals processes. And then later in 1951 was this protest here before they even got their court case here started. Mm -hmm. But in terms of a wide-scale kind of nonviolent protests, no, you know, this is really one of the first that we have kind of record of because we think civil rights, we think 60s, we think big walkouts, we think right. sit-ins, we think marches, we think mm -hmm. the Freedom Riders, but this is long before all of that. They, these students here really didn't have a big sample to, to look to. You know, right. Barbara was very methodical. You know, she didn't tell a lot of people about what she was doing and she went to the woods for hours, you know, and prayed and meditated and eventually this idea came to her. You know, mm -hmm. she viewed that as a divine intervention. But really, I mean, if it wasn't for, for, for Barbara, what the idea came, I don't know, because it really, like I said, wasn't a lot nationally happened similar to this. Right. Certainly know. not on a student level. Exactly. And um, that's that's what's fascinating to me is that right. a 16-year-old came up with this idea mm -hmm. and said, let's let's do something. You mentioned that people think of the 60s as uh, their era of civil rights. But there were definitely steps and events leading up to that, which oh, yeah. really puts this place, in my, my estimation, on the map. I mean, right. it, it's something that must be studied. Oh, yeah. What, in your estimation, led 16-year-old Barbara Rose Johns to make such a bold stand? Sure. I mean, you, you had already mentioned the, the bus crash and, and such like that. but <laughs> Sure, absolutely. Um, so there's a lot of things for Barbara. Barbara's a very intelligent student, but by no means was she did she start off as the, you know, the big kind of in-your-face, mm -hmm. all-over-the-place student. She's very intelligent, but she 
you know, she wasn't shy, but she kept to herself. And she would travel. She was part of different clubs and sport. Well, maybe not sports, but clubs and organizations through the Moton High School. And she'd mm-hmm. been to other high schools, segregated black high schools throughout the state. You know, so not only did she see Farmville High School every day, but, you know, she had these other high schools. Like, wait a minute, our school isn't unequal just compared to the white high school. Our high school is unequal compared to other black high schools throughout the state. Mm-hmm. You know, why is that? And there's this one incident uh, in which, so Barbara, you know, she took care of her younger siblings. And there's this one instance where she, she misses the bus. Uh, to go to Moton. Um, and so she's still standing outside trying to catch a ride to school and the white high school bus, Farmer High School, drives past. And so she flags him down and she tries to get on and ask for a ride to school. Well, that bus has to pass Moton High School on the way to Farmville mm-hmm. High School. But they said no. You know, it was mm-hmm. illegal. They weren't allowed to, to pick her up. And so mm-hmm. they left her there. Um, and I think eventually she did catch a ride to school, but, you know, it was a lot of different events like that that really was like, Barbara, why? You know, why? Mm-hmm. You know, why don't we have something equal? Why? Mm-hmm. Why? And I think that particular incident really kind of removed some hesitance for her, if there mm-hmm. was any, when they eventually decided that they wanted to integrate. I had mentioned that integration was not what these kids wanted at first, right. um, but the lawyers of the NAACP, that was their new strategy. They wanted equality and they wanted to sue. That's what they had to do. But I think Barbara... She's very intelligent. She realizes that, you know, we can get a new school, which would be great, you know, and that's what we want to go for. But who should say anything about the materials, buses, about, the, you know, anything else about maintenance? So it took a lot of things piling up on her to eventually, you know, and then the bus accident was really the culminating event where her best friend passed in a bus accident where she was like, you know, not only is this a threat to our education, it's a threat to our lives. Can't make it to school safely, let alone have a quality education once we got there. Um, and again, her, her faith was a really big inspiration for her. You know, she prayed a lot. And she meditated a lot. And eventually she was like reading the Bible. She's like, a child will lead. She's mm-hmm. like, and so she felt that she was the child. And so one of our big quotes with Barbara was that uh, she, she said, it wasn't any fear. I just thought, this is your moment. Seize it. So she had her moment. She seized it. And then she kind of stepped back out of the spotlight. And mm-hmm. The rest of her students, her classmates picked up the movement and went on forward with it. You mentioned her faith. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about uh, her church and pastor involvement uh, also within Farmville at that time as well? Sure. So Barbara lived in uh, Darlington, Darlington Heights, Virginia, mm-hmm. um, which is in Prince Edward County. Um, she went to uh, Triumph Baptist Church. Okay. Um, and that's where when her family, when her siblings and things come back, they will still go uh, to church there. But she formed a, a, a pretty good relationship with Reverend L. Francis Griffin, who was a pastor at First Baptist Church, which is actually in Farmville. Mm-hmm. And her uncle, you know, so she had a lot of, her uncle, Reverend Vernon John. So she had a lot of inspirations from, from really all over. And, and Vernon was a big civil rights guy. Not the sole inspiration for Barbara, but one of them. Um, and he was a pastor at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, which if that rings any bells, you know, he preceded Martin Luther King at mm-hmm. that church. Now, Dexter Avenue actually fires Vernon, thought he was too radical, thought he was too passionate about civil rights. <laughs> um, and they bring in a young 25-year-old. Martin Luther King Jr., mm-hmm. who's new in the town, who doesn't owe anybody any money, and they think that he's going to you know, be the solution to all the problems and not cause them any issues. But it's amazing the connections they, <laughs> that come through Farmville. Right. I mean, it's just fascinating. Oh, yeah. It's like, it's like Jerusalem. You know, all roads lead through Farmville <laughs> at some point. Right. Um, but they fire Vernon and bring in Martin Luther King Jr., and they reap what they sowed there. But, you know, so she had all these influences. She had Reverend mm-hmm. Griffin, who really helped her. She asked, what should we do, Reverend Griffin? He's like, you should sue. Contact these people at NAACP. Right? She had Uncle Vernon, who, mm-hmm. when her and her siblings would visit him, would, he would quiz them on different you know, black historical figures. Mm-hmm. So she had all of these, and then her faith, of course. You know, so that triangle of influence just really kind of weighing in on her and helping her to get to the point where she decided that it had to be her to do something. What impact did Barbara Stan have on the city of Farmville, and then further than that, Commonwealth of Virginia, and then eventually the United States? Sure. 
Um, did she did she meet her goals that she was setting out to reach when she started the movement? Yeah. So I'd say yes, um, but it, but it took a while. So it didn't it didn't happen immediately. Barbara, when she walked out, had no idea of what would happen several years later, eight years later to be to be precise. So 51, 1951 was the, the student walkout that led to their court case, which joined Brown versus Board of Education, ruled in 1954. So then we have uh, 1955 to 1959, Virginia Massive Resistance, which the state really did everything in their power to avoid listening to the Supreme Court, decision of Brown versus Board of Education. So mm-hmm. in 1959, Prince Edward County, when it was their time to integrate, to avoid this integration battle, they decide to close down all the public schools in Prince Edward mm-hmm. County for five years. Uh, so from 1959 to 1964, there are no public schools in Prince Edward County. Not a direct, direct response to Brown because that was in 54, but it was a consequence of that. And Barbara, there's no way she could have predicted in 1951, leading these students out, that eventually some of their younger siblings would have to deal with the ramifications Mm -hmm. of that protest and of the court decision. Mm -hmm. These students, again, only wanted the law to be followed. And they do eventually get, you know, African-American students do eventually get a new school um, in 1953, but it was an attempt to get them to stop suing. Mm -hmm. Um, And so they turned it down that year. Um, and they eventually did take that school uh, over after Brown versus Board of Education. But, you know, Barbara, there's no way she could have predicted it. She was trying to make a local change, trying to improve their situation. But eventually that was something that completely transpired into, into something uh, totally, totally different. So she had a huge, huge impact on Prince Edward County, uh, on the education system overall, nationally. But again, she was very humble. You know, she, she continued to live her life when she moved away because mm-hmm. she was threatened. But she really wasn't super active in, in movements mm-hmm. going forward. I think it's I think it's scary. It's scary. You know, she was sure. 16. She were, had received death threats, but she kind of lived her life. She graduated from high school. She went to Spelman College, and then she attended Drexel, and she became a school librarian. She had five beautiful children. Mm-hmm. Got married. You know, and she really lived out the rest of her life. Unfortunately, she passed back in 1991. But her legacy, I mean, really lived on through these students here at Moton. You know, through what would happen after that, through that that piece, you know, that strike, there were two more strikes that would happen, if not more. Um, one in the summer of 1963, when schools had been closed for four years, um, and then one in 1969, where uh, the the lack of schools were open and integrated, but severely underfunded. So her, she impacted a whole you know generation, if not more, of, of students and mm-hmm. people throughout the nation, for example. You mentioned she moved away. She went down to Alabama, correct? Mm-hmm. She moved to Montgomery, Alabama. Okay. And other other classmates also had to move away as well, correct? Mm-hmm. And then you mentioned also in the 60s, when we were going through the museum, uh, you had mentioned that uh, many students had to go out to Iowa and Connecticut right. and, and places like that right. because schools were closed, for exactly. one. You know, So that's an interesting consequence. It just floors me to think about that schools were closed for, uh, you mentioned, four years. What do you do in that situation? Obviously, right. it's going to uproot families. It's, it's going to have an impact, for sure. How has the, uh, the impact shaped and molded uh, modern education today? Integration, sure. you know, for one, is the, is, the, is the big thing, you know, yeah. because of the sacrifices of the students here, schools throughout the country were able to, to be integrated. Mm-hmm. So we end up with 117 total plaintiffs from mm-hmm. the Davis case, which is our court case here, that would join Brown versus Board of Education. Um, and that's about 70% of all the plaintiffs in Brown versus Board of Education, which is not, you know, no small feat. Out of the five court cases that went into Brown, it was also the only court case that was led by students. They got their parents to sign on because, you know, they were minors and they had to. They needed people who had jobs and owned land. But, you know, they, they were leading the way and setting mm-hmm. that example for many others others to follow. So in terms of the education system today, we, we learn about Barbara Johns now. We learn about civic right. engagement. You know, local college, Longwood University would say, you know, citizen leadership. Right. right. She was an original kind of example of that, that citizen mm-hmm. leader about being involved in the process. Um, so this past fall of 2017, she was included in the SOLs, the Virginia mm-hmm. Standards of Learning. 
So being recognized for that and really understanding, you need to understand Barbara and Moton to understand Massive Resistance, to understand you know Prince Edward School closings and what would happen after that. How many great migrations out of certain areas of Virginia to other areas mm-hmm. and the opening of lots of different private schools to avoid segregation and then going into Governor Linwood Holton in the 70s and him sending his children to primarily black schools, mm-hmm. which and how hugely significant that was. Mm-hmm. So I think wasn't a popular thing for him either. I, I think no. I've seen a picture of him uh, escorting his daughter, but there's also mm-hmm. a bodyguard around yeah. her leading her into the school. <laughs> right, it's just un- unreal to consider to think about today. Right. And that it took that long, <laughs> right? But, but that's the '70s we're talking about. Yeah. It's not the '50s. I mean, right, it's 20 years after this. Right. So uh, the ramifications are are still being felt that far out. And then you and I right. we talked about uh, a local private school here. Yep. You know that was '91, '92. I think mm-hmm. we just we deciphered. When they started to integrate, I mean, right. we're talking about the '90s. Right. We're not talking about the '50s. It's 40 right. years later. Right. Just, just unreal that uh, people don't. I know I, I personally have haven't considered it in that way. That in my lifetime, we were still dealing with a lot of these these issues um, right. and within this state, at least. Well, well, I'm sure the rest of the country. People think it was hundreds of years ago. When right. in reality, I mean, '68, so 50 years ago. I mean, the death anniversary of the assassination of King. Robert Kennedy. I mean, mm-hmm. 68 was a really big monumental right. year, and it was not that long ago. Right. But it's, it's hard to our hard parents, to sell to some folks. Our you know? parents were there. Right. I mean, <laughs> we, I can, we can reach out and touch right. somebody instead of just reading it in a book. And people who are, sure. I mean, 60 can vividly remember. Sure. You know, I'm sure, I'm sure a little bit younger, but can vividly remember where they were when Dr. King was, you know, was assassinated, mm-hmm. and that's a powerful experience to hear about. I know my father uh, often mentions that. He remembers, uh, I think he was in sixth grade, he was 12, when he heard about uh, JFK being shot. Mm-hmm. You know, and you remember all these things. For us, it's now 9-11. We, right. we think oh, of yeah. that, and I know where I was. But yeah, I mean, as far as this is concerned, it's you're right, it's not that long ago. Right. Uh, and there there are certainly a lot of things to learn from that, from that right. period and what, what's happened. Now, Canaan, for you specifically, uh, we we mentioned that uh, you can reach out and touch somebody instead of just reading it in a book. You actually had some some personal family connection to the events here at Moton. Uh, what can you share about that from your from your family history? Sure. So, I am a uh, great grandson of a plaintiff of Brown versus Board of Education from mm-hmm. the Davis case. Uh, so, my great grandfather, as well as his daughters, two of my great aunts. Now, my great-grandfather passed before I was born, as well as one of those aunts, my aunt Arlene, but my aunt Mildred, who was the other, I knew very well. You know, I Mm -hmm. spent very much time with my childhood with her, and I had no idea. (laughs) I mean, I really wish I could go back and say, hey, Aunt Mildred, you know, tell me, Mm -hmm. tell me about it. But too late now, of course, but, you know, but I admire them and the sacrifices they made, you know, to Mm -hmm. be a part of that court case and to be plaintiffs. And then my father, when Prince Edward County Schools closed down, kind of in response to Brown, uh, he was out of school for all all five of those years. Mm. Um, so he, and uh, when schools closed down in '59, was six. Mm-hmm. He went back at eleven, and I was in the first grade. Okay, as but, an eleven year old. As eleven years old. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So luckily, he finished high school age twenty two. Mm-hmm. But you know, if you were fifteen, sixteen when schools closed, and twenty twenty one when they reopened, a lot of people just never went back but my dad did luckily and he finished Mm -hmm. thank goodness but his he always had a really strict value of education for for me you know he went to the military and he later went to law enforcement Um, but when he had me and my some of my siblings it's always like you know keep your head in the books make sure you're studying during the summer times i remember very vividly all my friends would be out riding go-karts and things and i'd be inside doing homework that he created for me (laughs) to do right. you know make sure you keep your mind sharp and that's mm-hmm. honestly why I'm as good as at math as I am mm-hmm. today you know he'd always create multiplication and division uh, more so than any I think that was his best subject too but mm-hmm. um, I remember that very vividly but mm-hmm. that was what losing so much of his education did for him um, but for many others it had the opposite effect you know, like I I didn't go to school my kid doesn't need to go to school either the only reason they're here is because it'd be illegal otherwise right. um, teachers sending on homework and getting notes back saying, if you send these textbooks home with my child again, they'll become firewood, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's, 
a lot of ramifications, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. because of that. And you know, my family was really involved at every every kind of step. Very proud of of them and and the sacrifices they made. It's actually interesting because I was a student at Longwood University. Mm-hmm. I had no idea about my great grandfather. I knew mm-hmm. about my dad, but I had no idea about my great grandfather John. And I was mm-hmm. volunteering here at the museum. And I guess I was probably sweeping or something in the back of the auditorium, but we had these plaques. And I was just kind of so happy to look at it. And I was like, wait a minute, John, Arlene, Mildred Townsend. I was like, oh, Mildred? You know, I was just like, wait a minute, like those names sound. So I shook the family tree, you know, a little bit. And I was just like, wow, you know, those are, there's not other, another Mildred Townsend, mm-hmm. Arlene Townsend here. I mean, it could have been another John. Um, so I shook the family tree and I was like, wow, like this is, this is where I need to be. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I am really humbled and honored to be back here working yeah, in absolutely. honor of those family members. That's that's an it's an amazing legacy just yep. to, to consider. I mean, yep. you're working in a place that your family members had a historical impact. Right. It's it's really phenomenal. Finally, in what ways is the Moton Museum, because now you're the Director of Education, correct? Mm-hmm. Yep. In what ways is the Moton Museum endeavoring uh, to educate and safeguard these events and the legacy of those steadfast students? So we seek today to be a place of civil rights education, kind of first and foremost, but also to be a safe space for people to have these conversations. Mm-hmm. We, we want to be a community resource, a state and national kind mm-hmm. of resource for people but people will often come to the museum when they need to, to have these difficult discussions because of the historical significance of mm-hmm. Moton, of the high school students who went here and, you know, their contributions. People will come. Um, we had we do panels, you know, mm-hmm. speakers and things that come in who talk about different subjects. One of the most recent ones I can remember, we did this event called Am I, Am I Next? It was debunking stereotypes um, about police, you know, policing, police brutality. So we had a panel which had featured law enforcement, uh, some members of the community, people who had been you know, affected by police brutality in their, mm-hmm. in their past. And we just wanted to be the space to advance that dialogue. And I think that's our, our really big thing today. You know, that's how we continue to be relevant. Because, of course, I know this history is very important for everybody to learn. But in addition to that, you know, we use this history to help advance current dialogue that is happening um, locally, statewide, and, and nationally. Sure. You know, we want people to use Barbara Johns as their example, as their muse, you know, and these students. And then the students who are closed out, you know, as their example. Like, mm-hmm. hey, we don't fix it. This can happen. You know, look at what they did. We really stay here in the museum. I mean, these, we don't stick to these students being victims right we often try and victimize people who went through struggle and they did go through struggle Mm -hmm. it was a bad thing but they they were they were courageous yeah you know they were fighters Mm -hmm. they they weren't victims you know they fought Mm -hmm. every time the county did something they fought back and so it's up to us to use their examples today to kind of teach like hey don't have to just sit and deal with it you have way more resources than Mm -hmm. what barbara johns had right Um, i tell the kids when i'm you know giving tours or in schools I'm like, look, you could, in a couple of characters, tweet out mm-hmm. <laughs> and start a protest. We're going, mm-hmm. on, we're going on strike, hashtag revolution, right? Something right. like that. But Barbara had to pass around notes, she had to sneak right. around the class, she had to set no up internet. meetings, right? <laughs> there's no Facebook, there's right. no Twitter, there's no Snapchat, anything. She had yeah. to be methodical, right. right? They had to prank call the principal to mm-hmm. get him out of the school. You know, There was no anything, right? So they right. had her in a much better position today than even Barbara was in you know, to, to, to organize and to, to make positive change. But Certainly. Now you mentioned going to different schools and, and you do that throughout the state or throughout mm-hmm. throughout the nation or just, just in this area? So far, just the state. Okay. Um, I'm very willing to, to, to go out, but we uh, recognize it's, it's difficult for some schools right. to, to come into the museum. And we, we love hosting people here in the museum, but we also mm-hmm. understand the importance of taking the story on the road to different locations. We have some pretty good off-site programming as well. How can others learn more about uh, the Farmville student movement? Uh, wh- where would they go to? Websites? I mean, we got the internet now, not like Donald Yeah, John's absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, what would you recommend? Uh, different different sites or different books, different resources? So others that are interested in, mm-hmm. in what happened here, that they can do more personal yeah. uh, personal education. Absolutely. Firstly, come visit. <laughs> yes. Farmville, Virginia. Highly recommended. Um, Great place here. Really 900 is. Griffin Boulevard, Farmville, Virginia, <laughs> 23901. That's first and foremost. If you can't, which I understand a lot of people can't, um, 
go to thing our website has some pretty good stuff on there uh, mm-hmm. moatmuseum.org all lowercase usually if you google Barbara Johns or if you mm-hmm. google Moton or Moton Museum will come up and there are two books that are actually very useful in understanding the story and this history the first is They Closed Their Schools by Bob Smith um, fantastic book really encompasses 1951 to 64 history the background a lot of what happened here uh, we base the big portion of our galleries actually upon that book so that's mm-hmm. a great resource if people are interested second book is uh, Bound for Freedom by uh, Neil Sullivan and that book talks primarily about kind of the 59 64 when the schools were closed period uh, but from the perspective of somebody who was here and working with the schools and trying mm-hmm. to get those uh, back open and the free schools organized and a really great resource as well for people really interested in this history. So they close their schools and bound for freedom are two great books. Okay. Well, Kanan, I greatly appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thank Definitely you for check me. out the sources. Check out check out the Moat Museum if you if you're coming mm-hmm. through Farmville. Absolutely, come on by. It's well worth your time. Kanan's staff, I'm sure, will be just as congenial as he is, and he's he's been a wonderful host. I appreciate Absolutely. it, Kanan. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for supporting the Virginia History Podcast. It's greatly appreciated. Please continue to spread the word and help this colony to keep growing. Start by following us on your favorite podcast provider, like us on Facebook, and visit the website. Sharing episodes and other work is the best way to expand the community. Another way to greatly aid the podcast is by providing feedback on iTunes. If you have yet to do so, please take a few minutes and leave us a comment. Doing so helps bring exposure in the iTunes network. If you would like to do more, please consider supporting the podcast on Patreon. Links can be found on the website, or one can visit the campaign at patreon.com forward slash vahispod to see the choices and rewards being offered for your support. And please join me next time as we continue our walk through Virginia's history.